Okay, we get started. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are located in the world. Welcome to African Climate Week 2021, which aims at accelerating collaboration and integrating climate action into global pandemic recovery processes. For the African Climate Week, there are actually three tracks. Each track focuses on one theme and runs for a few hours each day of the week. Uh, for example, track one is on national actions and economy-wide approaches. Uh, the theme for track two is integrated approaches for climate resilience development, while for track three is about seizing transformation opportunities. You are presently attending a session in track two. And our session is about safeguarding wetlands as, as risk-based approach. This event is co-organized by four partner institutions. One is Wetlands International, the second one is CARE, the third one is International Alert, and the fourth one is International Water Management Institute. This, uh, organizations together are driving the BLISS initiative. BLISS stands for Blue Lifeline for a Secure Sahel, and that we will be talking about that during this session. Please note that this event will be recorded. It's already been recorded, just for your information. Thank you for joining. My name is Olufunke Kofi, and I'm the West African Regional Representative for the International Water Management Institute, ILMI. IOMI is a research organization that's working on innovative water solutions for sustainable development in the global south. I'm moderating this session and I'll be doing it together with my colleague, Julie Molonga. Julie. Thank you, Funke. Uh, my name is uh, Julie Mulonga, as Funke has uh, mentioned. I'm the director for Wetlands International Eastern Africa. So we invite all participants to this session. We ask you to introduce yourselves in the chat box. Uh, we will use the chat box only for introductions. Kindly put your name, your organization, and the country you're from. And the Q&A will be used for questions. Questions will be answered by participants, sorry, questions will be answered um, at the end um, and during this um, session. So welcome to Dave. Back to you, Funke. Okay, thanks, Julie. Yeah, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the aim of this session is actually threefold. One is to highlight the need for healthy wetlands in relation to climate change and resilience of communities. The second is to show that restoring and safeguarding wetlands is actually possible and is already happening in many locations. And we would like to identify challenges and opportunities that are associated with this restoration efforts. We want to see what is actually happening in different parts of the world of Africa, to be precise. And the third uh, objective is to mobilize stakeholders, their participants, that includes yourself, to get engaged in initiatives that are focusing on the role of wetlands for climate security and resilience building. We hope that at the end of this session, we would have been able to achieve these objectives. To be able to do that, uh, we have a short agenda, and thanks, Lydia, you have put it on the chart already. Uh, we will look at a short video for about five minutes, and then we move on to panel presentation for another 30 minutes thereabout. And then we'll spend the remaining parts of the session to look at uh, the questions that are coming up and some answers to them. Hope that we'll be able to engage with the participants uh, as much as possible during that time. So please drop your questions and comments on the chat box as Julie has advised. As you know, uh, wetlands are important for the well-being of people. An example is the inner Niger Delta in Mali that provides livelihood support to up to 2 million people. So the video we're going to show uh, is uh, it's about uh, the inner Niger Delta. In the video, we will see three leaders reflecting on the importance of the Delta 
and what needs to happen at the local level to safeguard the wetlands while climate is changing. So we will now move on to watch the short video. C'est clair parce que la zone humide là constitue une ressource de grande valeur économique, scientifique, culturelle et récréative pour l'ensemble des populations. Bon, ces populations doivent vraiment voir la zone humide et puis essayer de les protéger, de les revaloriser, de les revaloriser avec les moyens utilisateurs rationnels. The Inner Niger Delta is the second largest wetland area in Africa. It is the most naturally productive area of Mali. For centuries, fishers, farmers and herders from different ethnic groups have made good use of the Delta's natural resources. So, the issue is what? C'est la pauvreté de la population qui les amène à faire cela. Pour nous, l'organisation de la société civile, nous ne cantons pas la sensibilisation. On sensibilise les groupements, les chefs religieux, pour ne pas que les gens dégradent les zones humides. Car la dégradation des zones humides, la sécheresse va nous envahir. C'est pourquoi le rougir a été créé dans ce sens, afin, dans un contexte sous-régional, d'effectuer cette opération de sensibilisation, de formation et de réponse aux risques des aléas climatiques que cela peut engendrer. Et il est bon d'impliquer les femmes et les jeunes puisque ces couches-là ont été toujours marginalisées par le jus et coutume pour qu'ils puissent se sentir capables, responsables dans la gestion. Il faut quand même leur implication, leur adhésion dans le processus de la gestion. Pourquoi le renforcement et l'engagement des gouvernements locaux pour la gestion résiliente des zones humides Il est bon de renforcer les collectivités et avoir même leur engagement. La collectivité étant le premier responsable du développement de la commune et le premier décideur. Donc il est quand même bon d'avoir leur engagement pour qu'ils puissent prendre des actions de restauration des zones humides dans leur programme de développement communautaire. Et avoir, c'est suite à ça qu'ils peuvent avoir des financements pour la réalisation. Thank you very much for bringing us to West Africa. I hope you all enjoyed the short video. Uh, we just saw that uh, the people are, are explaining why wetlands are very important and what is already happening and should happen at the local level to safeguard and restore wetlands from all kinds of collective actions to capacity development and all that. Uh, it's very informative. Thank you for that. So building on this, we will want to move on to uh, at different scales and other parts of Africa. Let's go a little bit out of West Africa. So we have three panelists that uh, we, are, we are fortunate to have them with us. That will be taking us to other parts of Africa and to other, another level beyond the local level. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, George Sanga uh, Kavulunzi of the Global Water Partnership, Eastern Africa. Uh, GWP Eastern Africa is composed of nine country water partnerships and counts over 200 partners operating in these countries to address water security issues and environmental challenges such as droughts, floods, uh, food insecurity, climate change, and water insecurity. George uh, Sanga is the regional coordinator of the GWP uh, in Eastern Africa and is based in Uganda. Thank you, George, for joining. I'll be coming to you shortly. Let me introduce the other two panelists, Dr. Karunga Keita of Wetlands International Sahel Office. Uh, the Wetland International is the only global not-for-profit organization that is dedicated to the conservation and restoration of wetlands globally. They look at the environmental values of wetlands as well as the services that they provide to people. So the Wetlands International Sahel Office 
is one of the 20 offices of the network. Dr. Karunga is the director of that office in the Sahel and is based in Mali. We'll be listening to him and bringing his experiences from Mali. The third person is Dr. Paul Evistangen of the Great Green Wall Initiative, uh, which is a Pan-African flagship program supported by the African Union Commission. And it's the program, the initiative is aimed at resilience building in the dry areas, dry lands of Africa through sustainable land management, restoration, and sustainable economic development projects. Dr. Paul is the coordinator for the Great Green Wall Initiative at the African Union Commission and is based in Ethiopia. So we have someone coming from Ethiopia, from Uganda, and from uh, Mali as uh, our panelists today. Their participants, as we listen to the panelists, remember to use the Q&A box to post your questions, which we will uh, endeavor as much as possible to address during the last uh, 15 minutes of this session. Thank you very much. Uh, I would want to ask some questions. First of all, to Sangha. Uh, Sangha, you've been working a lot in the Eastern Africa, working in nine countries with more than, with about 200 partnerships. Um, I want you to explain to us what is the GWP East Africa doing to safeguard and restore wetlands? What, what are some of the challenges that the partnership faces regarding these efforts? And what opportunities exist to scale up? So there are three kind of questions that are mixed together there. Um, what are you already doing to safeguard and restore wetlands? What are some of the challenges that the partnership is facing? And what are the opportunities that exist to scale up uh, the innovations that you are promoting in Eastern Africa? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Funke. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, we have uh, two projects that are targeted at uh, safeguarding wetlands and also uh, action planning towards uh, achieving uh, the SDGs uh, that are targeted towards uh, wetlands. Uh, first of all, we are uh, implementing a project uh, that is uh, within the context of SDG 6 support program. And we are, uh, we are particularly interested in target 6.6, .6, uh, which of course seeks to halt the degradation and destruction of wetlands and also assist recovery of those already degraded. And uh, in particular, we're implementing a pilot project that is targeting indicator 6.61, tracking changes over time in terms of the uh, spatial extent uh, of wetland, uh, you know, uh, and inland, other inland open waters in terms of uh, quantity and uh, in terms of quality as well. So we want to see uh, over time, how are wetlands uh, getting more degraded or uh, getting, uh, what is the rate of recovery? And so we are implementing a pilot project uh, that is aimed at integrating freshwater data into sector-wide decision-making in order to improve the protection and restoration of the wetlands. And we are partnering with the UNEP, uh, the UNDP, under the guidance of uh, the, the UNEP DHI and also we are working with the uh, UNDP CAPNET with whom we are partnering. So the pilot project is currently uh, being piloted in three countries, Kazakhstan, Argentina, and Kenya in our region. So what we are seeking to do is, um, you know, be, uh, they, uh, seeking to highlight the importance of the uh, natural environment in achieving the SDGs, in particular, the freshwater ecosystems, uh, which are the wetlands, and also ensure that decision makers have the kind of data and information at their disposal uh, that they need to better understand and also make more informed uh, interventions in this area. In addition to that, uh, coming closer to the Sahel, uh, we, we are um, implementing a project aimed at strengthening the resilience of smallholder farmers and pastoralists in the IGAD region. And we are working with four countries, uh, namely Djibouti, Sudan, Kenya, and Uganda, 
and we're also partnering with the uh, IGAD, uh, the, the Intergovernmental Authority on, uh, on Development, and also as well as the IGAD Climate Prediction and uh, uh, Application Center, ICPAC. So the aim of this is to use early warning systems uh, in order to uh, support the local communities and also the decision makers uh, to, to, to have uh, kind of adaptation actions that preempt uh, the de-escalation de or uh, the, the pollution of the already available water resources, but also uh, seeking to increase uh, the availability. And uh, one of the uh, thematic areas is actually the promotion of uh, innovative actions. And we want to ensure that uh, the wetlands that are already uh, there in these very uh, arid and semi-arid areas are well preserved and we are able to manage them in a more uh, coordinated manner. That is uh, bridging the, the gap between policy and practice. So this is uh, how we, we intend to come in uh, it, because the business as usual has never really worked. Uh, in terms of um, the challenges that we are facing, uh, first of all, there are various governance challenges that exist because um, linking up uh, the, the already existing policies and the already existing institutions that have been set up to address uh, uh, climate-related challenges uh, in regard to, to, to the conservation and uh, uh, protection of wetlands this uh, setup is already there, but in most cases, it's uh, always on paper. And you find that there's quite a gap between the local communities that are uh, more affected at the, at, the, at the local level, and also the various policies and action plans that have already been formulated. So there needs to be uh, a multi-stakeholder engagement around uh, these processes to ensure that uh, what is planned can actually be implemented on the ground and also be implemented within a multi-stakeholder uh, setup with buy-in from all uh, uh, stakeholders, including the local communities that are targeted. So uh, in terms of um, uh, de degradation, uh, issues outside the institutional setup, uh, but which are also challenges, we, you find that uh, most of it, the, the land is degrading very fast. Uh, you have uh, flooding and drought cycles, which are increasing in frequency. And, uh, and this leads to uh, land degradation. It leads to siltation of wetlands and also as well as uh, pollution issues and so on. So this is uh, uh, escalated by the fact that especially in the pastoralist uh, regions, there's a lot of uh, migration from one water point to another, from one wetland to another. And so uh, most of the time, the, these ecosystems are left unprotected. So if, uh, the, 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 and also of late, we've had issues of invasive species, uh, which we, we never used to see before. So um, mo most of the time, uh, you, you find that it is uh, all about, uh, the planning around these systems. And so uh, we, we, we have water, we plan for domestic use, we plan for industrial use, but we never really uh, give uh, the wetlands its due in terms of preserving it as well, because we need water also for the environment as well. So um, what we are looking at in terms of opportunities that exist, uh, and uh, having identified obstacles in terms of uh, uh, institutional as well as uh, climate related challenges which uh, have a direct impact. Uh, we are looking at integration of, of, of uh, climate resilience uh, into sectoral planning. And this is in, in, in terms of capacity building uh, and also or capacity enhancement because there's been a lot of exercise around capacities. Uh, but also, uh, most importantly, I think uh, the issue of funding yeah, is, is quite prevalent always, but uh, what we need is not just funding, but targeted funding. And we need to have more catalytic funds like the ecosystem-based uh, adaptation fund, uh, which uh, is a relatively new one to catalyze action already on the ground. So 
we also have so many uh, climate related uh, uh, global funds available and we need to tap into them like the GCF of course uh, adaptation fund uh, and so on so I feel that we need to get together have more organizations coming together to access the funding but also targeting it effectively so maybe I'll stop there right now uh, just saying that we need to actually prioritize as well in, in terms of uh, interventions uh, thank you Thank you very much, Sangha. You have uh, given us insight into some of the things that GWP East African is doing, uh, including the projects and, and activities that is, uh, aim at um, creating more awareness, increasing people's understanding, and bridging the gap between policy and practice. You have also identified the challenges, and you're already making efforts uh, to, to uh, address those challenges, working with multi-stakeholder platforms and aiming at integrating climate resilience into some of those uh, development agendas. Thank you very much. I will now quickly move on to Karunga uh, of Wetlands International office, uh, Sahel Office. Uh, Karunga, I know that Wetlands uh, International is, is one of the initiators of the, of the Bliss Initiative. Um, but beyond that, what, what are those other initiatives, what are the initiatives in general that you already see happening around around safeguarding and restoring wetlands in, in the Sahel, in, in, in West Africa, uh, in the in Niger Delta, or just in West Africa where, where you're working. Can you give an example what is being addressed? And can you elaborate a little bit on the Bliss Initiative? Uh, over to you, please. Can you do that within uh, seven minutes? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Funke. Uh, for your first question, uh, what are the main risks for Africa continent uh, currently with regard to climate risk? For us, it is the current trend of ecosystem degradation able to jeopardize the development perspective in Africa by creating instability, insecurity, and even conflict. This degradation, degradation is due mainly to two interlinked factors, anthropic actions and climate change. For anthropic action, for example, huge infrastructure disturbing the reverse lakes dynamics that can contribute to make climate change effect more impactful. This tendency is accentuated in Sahel, where there is already a fragile, fragile systems, ecosystems, and scarcity of natural resources, while these resources are vital for human survival and biodiversity. Properly, in Sahel, even if wetlands constitute less than 10% of the total surface, they are hosting more than 75% of Sahelian population and contributing to more than 80% of GDP of each country in Sahel. So impacting positively wetland dynamic will be impactful for Sahel overall in terms of development sustainability. In economic point of view, as well as socially and ecologically. That is why wetlands uh, based on water dynamic mainly are the lifeline in Sahel. And why our Blue Lifeline initiative for Secure Sahel is focusing on wetlands landscape as the entry point to sustainable development. So focusing in this way, we think that we can address risk threatening both wetlands and dry land. So focusing on wetland is justified, not 
by neglecting dry lands, but by the fact that there are the most efficient way to address development issues. For your second question about the initiatives in West Africa. Yeah, maybe you can just focus on the Bliss initiative and tell us what is the goal and how the success look like briefly. Thank you. Okay. So uh, you mentioned, because I forgot the last part of uh, your question. Yeah, yes, I said you can focus on the Bliss initiative, the Blue Lifeline initiative. Okay. Just that, yes, because of time. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. So, so I can continue or you will be back? No, please continue. I just, uh, you are responding to the, my last question and I said that I know that there are many initiatives in, in the Sahel, but you can uh, just yes. focus on addressing the Blue Lifeline uh, initiative. Okay. Yeah, okay. just that one. Tell us what okay. is the goal and uh, how does success look like for the Bliss initiative? Oh, okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you for clarification. Okay, in West Africa, uh, certainly we have two major uh, river basin covered by our Blue Lifeline initiative. For example, the inner Niger, Niger Delta with regard to climate change adaptation action, we have a lot of successful experience, both to reduce climate and climate risk and poverty. In the specific case of Uwaru, for example, in multi-region, WISO Wetland International Sahel Office implemented more than 1,510 hectares of burgu. Burgu is a water grass, a sort of water grass specific to in Niger Delta. And we have a lot of experience in this regard. In this circle, uh, during the rainy season 2019-2020, after assessment of the experience, we found, found that Burgu is more economically, uh, has a higher Per, per hectare than rice production, for example. This is very important to know because in addition to the economic value of Burgu, Burgu is fertilizing soils and enriching aquatic biodiversity, while cultivating rice can degrade fertilate. fertilate. Uh, okay. Elsewhere, Burgu is contributing to social cohesion and stability. And all the parts of Burgu are consumed by different water user groups, from roots to leaves and seeds. So to be, uh, to commit communities in the Burgu culture, we get their commitment right and communi communi uh, commitment to respect the planning and the implementation of sustainable burgo culture. The key of the success is due to the community commitment, despite the insecurity situation. And in fine, how we succeed to commit all these community leaders apparently opposite by their interest in the Burku culture. Because before that, we structured these communities through union and coalition to solve and discuss questions, development questions about violence. So this is the, a key of success in Uwaru circle. 
just to limit to one example. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Karunga. Thank you. I want to take you take us a little bit away from the inner Niger Delta now to go to the whole Sahel uh, to look at the Great Green Wall Initiative under the African Union Commission. So my question to Paul is. Uh, given that the, the initiative is, is looking to uh, restore 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, what are you doing to restore degraded wetlands specifically? And what challenges does the Great, great, uh, green, great, wall, um, great Green Wall <laughs> face regarding safeguarding and restoring wetlands? And, and what opportunities exist to scale up some of those initiatives that you have identified? So again, these are three questions in one. If you could just briefly uh, elaborate on, on them. Thank you, Paul. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Olu Fonke. Um, thanks a lot and thanks for inviting us uh, uh, to this very important webinar, which is touching one of the most important uh, um, uh, um, uh, development uh, challenges that the continent is facing. As far as water is concerned, as, you, as we know very well, uh, water, the main uh, um, uh, is the main development factor, is the main multiplier, main development factor uh, for development on the continent. Without water, uh, there is, we can't do anything from agriculture, wash, hygiene, and everything that, that we, we, we are talking here today. So the, the, the framework of the African Union and the the Department for Sustainable Environment and Blue Economy, uh, a lot is being done to enhance uh, uh, policy on the continent uh, in the domain of, of uh, uh, enhanced uh, sustainable management of water, both at the supply uh, uh, level and at the, at the resource. The, the, at the African Union, we have a new um, uh, um, uh, division that is going to deal with issues to do with water and blue economy. That in itself takes, is focusing on looking at the issue of, of uh, uh, wetlands, river basins, watershed, uh, a big, big, big um, uh, chunk of this new um, uh, uh, division, division for blue economy. And we're going to look at water across the board. You know, there's a, a serious dichotomy because there's a lot of talk about the wet, about the dry lands in the Sahel. The Great Green Wall is all about the dry lands. There's a lot of of um, uh, of investment, you know, uh, into the dry lands. But as I noticed in, in the write ups that was shared, there is little, not much attention is paid to the wetlands. And it's really, a, it's, it's really a, a serious challenge. And so within the framework of the Great Green Wall, we are looking at the issues to do with the watershed, source of water, the water basins, and the wetlands. And that is why uh, from the beginning, uh, the Africa you know, have been very, very um, uh, interested in issues of in the new program that uh, wetlands and partners are developing the bliss. We are very interested in the bliss. We want to integrate the bliss with the with uh, the 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 Great Green Wall, you know, so that because when you talk dry lands, you flip the other points. You are talking wetlands, and if we don't take serious of our water resources, our water of the wetlands of our water basins, and we are focusing on planting trees, there is. It said it's, 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 it's not sustainable. And so uh, within the framework of the Great Green Wall, we are working with various partners. We are enhancing our, 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 our work on, on wetlands. Our new strategy is under development both in the Sahel and the Southern Africa region, very strongly at the issues of how to enhance the management and the regeneration and restoration of water bodies as a matter of policy. And, and, and so, so water 
and, it's, and water bodies are very uh, important. If you ask me what are the challenges that we are facing, of course, as I said, there is very little or not enough attention is being paid on the issues of water. Water in its entirety, the whole water value chain is not really taken care of as opposed to um, uh, um, uh, forestry and, and, uh, uh, and uh, dry lands. So this is a serious issue. And when you move, when you go into the, um, uh, when you go into, into look at the uh, policy in, in general, both at the continental level and at the uh, sub-regional and national uh, level, you realize that clear and updated policies on water are not very, very, um, uh, um, uh, are not very, very there. We have here the, the Kigali Action Plan on Water at the level of the Africa Union, but implementation has been very slow. We talk a lot about the land, but forgetting the water. So the challenge is the silo system, the way we are looking at all of these issues. We have this silo system, both at the level of implementation and at the level of policy. That is a big hindrance and a big uh, challenge that we are facing. We need to develop a system where, when you are talking about dry lands, you are talking about wetlands, because the two go together. The dry lands are there because there's lack of water. And if we want the dry lands to become wet or to have sustainable uh, water provision, we need to take care of the wetlands, both at all the levels, both at the watershed, the water resource, the wetlands, and also the basins. So the biggest challenge is the silo system. And that's why we are also working very closely now with, with AMCO, the African Ministerial uh, Commission on Water. In fact, currently we are uh, working with them on how to enhance our, our partnership in the water sector. And so- Thank you very they, much, they, Paul. They, I've, got to, I've got to let you touch on opportunities as well. Um, exactly. You are talking about challenges. Yeah, what are the opportunities that exist to be able to scale up some of those uh, innovations that you have identified. Exactly. So the, the, you know, the opportunities that are there first, when you look at the development of bliss, I see bliss as a serious opportunity. I see bliss as one big opportunity that all the partnerships should focus on the implementation of bliss. And it shouldn't just be for global water partnership or wetlands international or those who are in water. It should be for every, every stakeholder. It should be for those who are working in dry lands, those who are looking at restoration, those who are looking at every other aspects because all of them, are, we are talking about the same thing. That is one opportunity. The second opportunity is the policy environment. Now, water is, going up the uh, uh, continental and, and, and uh, uh, policy agenda and also at the level of the RECs. We are developing at the African Union, we have this new uh, division that will be concentrating only on issues to deal with water. And so this is a serious opportunity, which means the advocacy on water is getting, is gaining its importance, which means this uh, investment in water is going to follow. And uh, I think next year we also have the World uh, uh, Water um, uh, um, World Water Forum water that is coming up in Dakar, right? Yeah. So we yeah. really need to focus on this. So you see that water is gaining traction because we or the world has realized that you can't be talking about development without looking at the main source of development or the main factor is development, which is water. So the policy environment is great and once the policy environment is great it means the investment and the finance which is so much uh, lacking will follow so these are uh, a globally some of the main challenges yeah some of the main opportunities okay thank you very much paul i see you are very much loaded there are quite a lot of things you can share with us I encourage you to maybe put some of those things on the Q&A. There are questions that are there. I will also ask you some questions directly there because of time. I want us to, I want to pass on to Julie so that she can look at the questions that are coming up and then uh, to see whether uh, Paul or Sangha or um, Karunga will be able to take any of those questions. 
Over to you, Julie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Funke. That was uh, a very informative session. Now, before we move on, we have some partners that we are working with, um, more specifically AICD and the World Bank. And I can see Takuya Shiraishi here. Now, Takuya, as you listen, I also want to hear your personal view. Um, what, what are you really doing to also safeguard um, wetlands uh, within the Sahel? And what do you see as, um, as opportunities as you work through the AICD? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is, can you hear me? Loud yes. and clear, Takuya. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Takuya, um, a Japanese consultant serving as the uh, AICD, African Initiative for Combating Desertification, um, which has been launched by JICA, UNCCD, and the governments of Kenya and Senegal. And we target uh, 15 African countries. And um, let me clarify that um, I express my personal opinion from the standpoint of consultants supporting the ICD secretariat, but not on behalf of the Japanese government or JICA. Okay, so um, just uh, to respond to your uh, question, uh, we, AICD has uh, three pillars. Um, first, networking and knowledge sharing and access to finance. And I think most of uh, these challenges or uh, the, the issues are the same, the common uh, with the uh, Bliss Initiative. And uh, through the experience of AICD, I think uh, one of the keys is, uh, as Paul uh, just suggested, um, partnership is very important. And more specifically for me, knowledge sharing through partnership and access to finance are uh, the main factors. First, uh, for example, when we talk about uh, relevant undertakings by Japan, they're having uh, several uh, capacity building projects in relation to wetlands and watershed management uh, at community levels, but not particularly in Sahel, but in other regions such as Uganda, Iran, and Madagascar and so on. But in most cases, their outputs, such as established methodologies or technical modules, that can be, that probably uh, may probably be applied uh, to the Sahel context, is not really, um, how can I say, um, translated into English and uh, at uh, the disposition of uh, potential users. So this is a part of a uh, uh, kind of like lack of knowledge sharing, um, which may be used in a different context. And so this is the, uh, one of the challenges that we identified uh, during the AICD framework and opportunities in relation to Bliss is exactly the partnerships um, as Paul suggested, um, all the partnerships uh, who are related to uh, wetlands, not only wetlands, but also land degradation as well, uh, will can, can gather and uh, bring up their assets, knowledge, and so on, um, to think about uh, effective uh, programs and projects. And we, my personal view is not to insist on uh, the experiences which have been carried out in Sahel only, but other probably uh, similar agroecological areas, uh, there have been many um, good undertakings that we can take into consideration into uh, the activities in Sahel region. This is um, what I um, thought uh, during uh, this AICD initiative. I hope I, I respond to your question par partly, probably. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. I think what comes out very clearly, as, um, as uh, Elvis Paul has indicated, is the issue mm -hmm. of partnerships mm -hmm. and also the issue of, of knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when we go to the questions, the Q&A, there, there are three questions. 
So now, Paul, I, I turn back to you. Uh, I'd like to ask you, um, what are some of the economic tools that can really demonstrate or give this business case for protection and restoration of wetland ecosystems? Back to you. What are economic tools? Yes, there's a question there by Marion um, asking yeah. about the economic tools that can demonstrate these business cases. I think to demonstrate the business case for, for uh, sustainable water management is, is, is very easy. First of all, water is life. That is simple, very lay. Water is life. Without water, nothing else can happen. We use water for everything. If anybody wants to ask for uh, invest, in, if you want to invest in, in, in water and you need justification, if you look at um, uh, um, the percentage of Africans that have access to portable water is actually very low. If you look at the challenges of water, of portable water in our cities. We have serious shortage of water in all the cities across Africa, which means the investment potential is very high. We have serious, um, uh, uh, we have legislature, like I mentioned the Kigali Action Plan for water, which exists, which can seriously, which if anybody is interested in investing in water, you can easily um, uh, um, uh, use um, uh, um, uh, these action plans that clearly spell out what uh, our member states should be doing, what the country should be doing. That in itself is a serious tool that you can use for, for, um, uh, to argue for, for investment. If you look at the increasing demand for water at all levels, both for agriculture, water for, for, for irrigation, water for fishing, water for urban agriculture. So there is a huge demand for water. And I don't, if I get my statistics right, less than 30% of our urban drillers have access to portable water continuously. Here in this huge city like Addis Ababa, we have the tap flows averagely about three days in a week. And so there's a huge potential for investment in this, in this region. And there is a huge potential if you want to look into the issues of restoration of water. We need to invest in the restoration of the water sources. The challenges of water, of water degradation is going to be the main uh, uh, challenges that we are going to have in the years to come. Already we are seeing the serious conflict that is existing between our member states because of use and access to water. So yes, we can, there's a lot of tools that exist. There's a lot of justification that exists if we want to invest in water. We have all this uh, uh, water partnerships, we have all these water strategies that exist and so on. So yes, water, um, uh, as I said from the beginning, the sector was neglected, but right now the sector is one of the most sought after sector now in, in the development world due to the, in the direct and indirect impacts of the lack of water on health, on peace, on security, on national cohesion and on everything. So water, the standard water is life, used to be used as a proverb, but now it's a, it's a reality. Water is actually life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think that sort of answers um, some of the questions that have been put out there. There's a very specific one from Halinishi on sand harvesting. Um, that one, I think I've seen your email and we will, or rather we've seen your contacts and we will get back to you on that since that is very specific to sand. Um, there's another question on examples. I think um, that has been answered by, um, by Karunga when he gave the example of the Burgu and also what they've, they've learned from the experience on Burgu in Mali. 
So that answers some of the questions within um, the Q&A tab. Now, I just want to go back to each of the panelists. Uh, the Africa Climate Week is actually a preparation for the UNFCC. Now, um, during this UNFCC COP, we will discuss with actors at the global level what they can do to help address obstacles and also build on opportunities in relation to climate change. Uh, please, can you just say in one sentence what global actors should do to help in re re restoring and safeguarding wetlands? So for this one, maybe I, I will start with uh, George Sanga, just one sentence. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. I think I, I, I will, uh, my sentence starts with the economic tools. Um, we need to impress on them uh, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, because, uh, full stop. But the explanation is that, uh, you know, when you look at, we've been looking too much uh, at the supply side and we are not looking at the management side of uh, wetlands. So, so that's the reason why uh, we need to give them uh, the, the business case for wetlands protection. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. We need to give them the business case. Over to you, Karunga, just in one sentence, please. Okay, thank you, Julie. Uh, I would like to mention that, uh, sorry, do you hear me? Do you hear me? L loud and clear, Karunga. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, wetlands are not only the most productive capital for people, but also the more accessible capital for people in Sahel. And wetlands is a barrier for conflict and instability. So investing in wetland as a priority can be the main lever for sustainable development in Sahel, meaning stability, security, and peace for Sahel overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Karunga. Over to you, um, Elvis. Yes, thank you, Julie. I think as a final word, we can't say much about the importance of water. We have seen this uh, during the COVID. We are living in the COVID era, and suddenly we saw how important water was. And so I think the, 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 the word I can say is we cannot pretend to, be, to, 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 to try or to say we, are, we want to be resilient we want to adapt, we want to mitigate climate change, and we neglect the water sector. The water sector is the most important. The wetlands, as uh, uh, Karunga said, are the most important in terms of development on this continent. So if we want to achieve our indices, if we want to achieve our SDGs, if we want to achieve the Africa Agenda 2063, we must focus on the sustainable management of wetlands, sustainable management of water, and there is an urgent need for investment in the sector. Thank you very much. Excellent. A good way to finish off that. Um, I think what I heard uh, very clearly, wetlands are very important for development. And to achieve most of our agendas, we need to focus on um, sustainable, sustainable development of the wetlands. So I don't have much time. I'll hand over back to, to Funke. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for that session. Uh, very insightful uh, discussions. Thanks to all participants for your contribution and to the panelists, of course. Um, as a way of summarizing the, this session and, and, and then talking about the next step, uh, we have seen the importance of wetlands. We have seen also uh, the fact that to safeguard and restore wetlands contributes to increasing 
uh, water security, human security as well, and enhancing resilience uh, of communities and, and reducing climate risk. Uh, from the discussions also, we have seen that uh, it requires action from local to global level. Uh, very important is the aspect of partnerships and collaborative efforts. I heard um, Sangha talking about multi-stakeholder uh, platforms and people processes doing things together. I heard uh, Evie talking about uh, not working in silos, but even at the policy level, but also at the practice level, uh, coming together to do things uh, uh, and, and leverage on what opportunities exist in different sectors. Uh, we have also seen that it is possible to safeguard and restore working plans. Uh, from the example that we, we saw in the, in the Sahel, uh, in the Naibigze, and, and uh, from the videos also that we watched. Um, we also seen that, of course, there are challenges. Uh, for, uh, if we want to safeguard and restore wetlands, there are quite a lot of challenges. And these challenges could be technical or political and also financial challenges. And that we need to do more uh, to address them. And we have to address them collectively, bringing all the necessary actors together. Um, there are many climate change adaptation actions and land degradation wider development initiatives that are going on across the region, across the Sahel. Uh, we need to take advantage of these opportunities uh, and, to, and to, to see how to, to combine efforts to scale them up. So I want to thank you all participants and particularly our panelists and all who that have contributed in one way or the other. We will send you one follow-up email uh, with the contact uh, the details that are provided when you register and here on the chat box. And then we will provide additional information, for example, a link to the recording that uh, of this session, we'll send it to you, uh, and any other related blog posts that may come up or brief that may come out of this session, where we're going to send everything to you. Uh, I hope that we'll continue to uh, use this information and this insight that we have obtained today to inform some of these other initiatives that we're all doing in our respective organizations. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, in, in Wetland International, International Alerts Care and International Water Management Institute and all other partners. I want to say thank you for your contribution and wish you uh, a happy African Climate Week. Thank you. Bye-bye.